Okay, maybe I move away from Butchevum. <laughs> and yeah, so welcome, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and we already had some motivation to listen to my talk from Hans' talk. And before going to Carbon 12, uh, I will introduce our method. So uh, just a few words about the effective interaction we use, starting from a realistic one, then I will shortly discuss our many-body approach from ionic molecular dynamics, and then as a first application of FMD for reaction calculations, I will show our result for the helium-free alpha-gamma capture reaction. And then I will go to carbon-12, and as for calculations with continuum are not so easy, I started with a training exercise doing the microscopic cluster model using our framework, before then showing some preliminary results for the full FMD glory uh, with the continuum. Okay. We want to solve the many-body problem using realistic nuclear interactions, and when you look at the argon interaction, for example, you know you have a strong short-range repulsion, and you also have a strong tensor force, which you see here when you look at how the potential looks like as a function of orientation of the spins relative to the orientation of the nucleons. And these two features of interaction, the central correlations and the tensor correlations, will introduce strong short-range correlations in the main in the many-body wave function. So to solve the many-body problem, you have to deal with this issue, and a popular way nowadays doing this is using unitary transformations to transform your bare interaction into an effective soft interaction, and the method of choice we use is the UCOM, uh, UCOM U uh, unitary correlation operator method, and the basic idea here is that you have a correlation operator consisting of a central correlation operator which shifts the nucleons apart, so the here you see the two-body density of an uncorrelated trial wave function, a Gaussian type or mean field type, and you see you actually you have the highest probability where the two nucleons sit on top of each other, but they have a potential strong repulsive, so you have to shift them apart. This is done by this uh, correlation operator CR, and then in a second step we turn on tensor correlations, which give you these correlations between orientation of the spins and the relative orientation. And when you look at how this affects the energies, we just do a mean field type calculation, and you use the argon interaction, and you see you end up with something like 20 to 30 MV per nucleon above zero using the Bayer interaction, using this very simple wave functions without any correlations. But if you now transform the Hamiltonian first with a central and then with the tensor correlations, you see you end up in a reasonable range. And uh, of course, you increase uh, the binding but uh, by introducing the correlations, you introduce also higher coverage on the wave function, so kinetic energy goes up. Okay, the many-body method, it's FMD, so we are using Slater determinants, and the single particle states here in this approach are Gaussian wave packet. And uh, so in the wave packets, we have a parameter B, which is complex, and which gives you the mean position and the mean momentum of the single particle uh, state of the wave packet and um, we have a width parameter A. So this you, but if you have the same width parameter for all nucleons, you can translate that to a harmonic oscillator uh, parameter, but in FMD in general, this can have different values for each single particle state. Then there's a spinor part, so the spin can take any orientation, and we have the isospin, uh, either proton or neutron. An important point is so that uh, when you look here at this many-body wave function, so the Slater determinant is invariant on the linear transformation of a single particle state. So if you have two Gaussians which are just slightly displaced, uh, this is the same Slater determinant as using a Slater determinant built here from the S state and the P state, which you just get by doing the symmetric and the anti-symmetric combination of these two Gaussians. So in this limit, uh, this wave packet basis is equivalent to the harmonic oscillator. On the other hand, you can easily imagine you can displace your wave packets in coordinate space or in momentum space, and then you have a picture of a print type cluster wave function. So uh, this basis includes both shell model and uh, cluster model uh, on the same footing. So the intrinsic wave functions, so the Slater determines Q, in general, don't have good symmetry, so with respect to rotation or parity, so we restore the symmetries by projection on parity, on angular momentum, so this is a full three-dimensional angular momentum projection, and also uh, the translational invariance is restored by projecting on total linear momentum, zero. In the end, we will have a set of intrinsic basis states here labeled by QA, and uh, our basis consists of 
linear combinations of these projected intrinsic states and when we have to solve a many body problem by this generalized uh, eigenvalue problem where you have a Hamiltonian kernel and a norm kernel on the right side. So, so both the single particle bases and the many body bases uh, are non-orthogonal, so you always have to deal with these norm kernels. But that's just a technical issue. Okay, coming to the first application, um, the helium-free alpha-gamma. So we will use our UCOM transformed argon V18, and so just for uh, the experts, so this is, we are taking our correlation functions from SRG transformation, so it's very similar to an SRG interaction, not completely the same. And uh, this corresponds to a very soft interaction, so we can't express many short-range correlations in a wave function, so we have a very soft interaction. And what we have to do to solve the scattering problem, so here we have a continuum helium-3 alpha, and we want to capture into the bound states of 3 half minus and 1 half minus state in beryllium-7, so we need these bound state wave functions, we need the scattering wave functions, and we have to calculate the essentially the dipole, electric dipole transitions between these wave functions. So, how do we set up our model space? So, on the one hand, we have uh, so-called frozen configurations, where we just take the ground state of the helium-4 and the helium-3 and put them at different separations, so here indicated by this label R. So, this we can then match in the end to the asymptotic world. We have just two point-like clusters of alpha and helium-3, so we can match to the Coulomb asymptotics. In the internal region, we want to, uh, we also have polarized configuration, so it's no longer just uh, the clusters in the ground states, but it's in a sense a real seven-body wave function, and uh, our basis states where we obtain by variation after projection on all the spins which are of importance, so three half minus, one half minus, also the positive parity states, and so on. And uh, to further enlarge our model space, we use the radius as a generator coordinate. So we have configurations which are more compact and which are more extended, and then when you go really far apart, you take these frozen configurations uh, built from the ground states. And uh, for including the boundary conditions, we use a microscopic R matrix method uh, developed by the Brussels group. Um, so I will come to that later when I discuss the common graph. Okay, so first, we need, as I said, we need the bound state wave functions. So here I have uh, the binding energies of a 3 half minus and 1 half minus state, so with respect to the threshold. And uh, you see the accumulative experiment is not perfect, but we are lucky in a sense that the centroid energy uh, of the 3 half minus and 1 half minus state agree with the experiment. And it turns out that the cross section is very sensitive that you get the threshold with respect to the centroid right. And, uh, if the splitting is a little bit too small, you only get a, a small change in the branching ratios, but the total cross-section is almost unaffected. Uh, we also look at the mirror system, so the lithium-7, and what is also important is when we look at observables like the charge radius, uh, these are in good agreement with the experiment, and this tells us essentially that the tail of our wave function is reasonable. And of course, we will sample mostly the external part of the wave function, so that is important. Um, for the uh, scattering states, so here I have the uh, phase shifts for the S-wave scattering here. So these are the black points are experimental data, and uh, they have a dash curve, which is using just the frozen configurations, the clusters in the ground states, and the solid line is a full calculation, including also uh, the polarized uh, configurations. And on top here you see the D-waves. And uh, so the data here are jumping around a little bit, but... Uh, that is certainly not real physics, but some experimental artifact. When we look at the F-waves, you see, uh, so again, the dashed lines are the frozen configuration only, so the D5 half comes out more or less, but what we see is that you have a splitting between the 5 half minus and the 7 half minus is too small. So there's an indication that this two-body interaction is lacking some spin-orbit strength. So, and we know that the Fujita Miyazawa term in a free-body force, for example, will give you additional spin-orbit strength. And later for the carbon-12, I haven't included the free-body force yet, so I will do a modification of a spin-orbit force by hand, so which is going away from the up initio principle, but uh, is still reasonable. Okay, so when we combine everything, our bound state wave functions and the scattering states calculate the dipole transition, so we can calculate the cross-section or what is plotted here, the S-factor, we just take out uh, the 
uh, Coulomb tunneling, you see that we agree very nicely, both in magnitude, normalization, and in the energy dependence uh, with this recent data. So there were lots of experimental activities, uh, or still ongoing experimental activities, to measure this very precisely. And you can also see here uh, this gray dot. So these are all the data. So this, this situation has really cleared up. And uh, now the data agree more or less. And uh, luckily, also the calculation agrees with the data. Um, we can analyze that in uh, more detail when we look at the overlap functions. Uh, so projecting the full seven-body wave function on the wave function for relative motion of two clusters. And uh, so you have here uh, the three half minus bound state. So when you take the RGM norm kernel into account, you get here the nodes in the wave function. Here we have the scattering state at 50 kV. And if you calculate the dipole matrix elements, so, so the dashed line is using just the asymptotics. Uh, so the matching here, so the Whittaker function for the bound state and the Coulomb scattering wave function, you get this one. And you see uh, most of the matrix element is coming really from large distances. But still, so the internal part here, so up to about five Fermi is important for the absolute magnitude. So uh, it's not enough to just to treat it in a sense as an external capture. You also have to think about the short range physics. Okay. Uh, interesting fact is, if you look at the mirror system, so this is the preton alpha gamma, the calculation agrees perfectly with the energy dependence of this data, the Pruni data, but the normalization is off by 15%, and now the question is, is it experiment or... So from the theory, so if the calculation works for the helium-3 alpha gamma, it should also work for triton alpha gamma. Um, so my guess would be there's some issue with the data, but... Triton is not a very popular uh, target or projectile <laughs> in the experimental community. Okay, coming to carbon-12. So uh, Hans was already talking a lot about that, and uh, I also expect Martin to spend uh, most of his talk on, on this topic, so I will be short on the experimental uh, introduction. So uh, what we are interested in are the Hoyle state and states higher lying in the continuum. So the second two-plus state, which we already had some discussions about, there's a second four-plus state, and uh, there are also additional states in the continuum. So what, what uh, Hans Sünbo was showing, you have this gamma of Teller or M1 transitions populating states, which are not uh, exactly the same ones. So and the, the challenge now is to include the continuum in our many-body calculation to really describe this continuum stuff. And uh, just uh, to give you an idea, so when you do up initial approaches, so we had a talk on lattice EFT by Dean Lee, so they have the whole state and also the second two plus state, but the properties like radii are still not really satisfactory, but uh, there's impressive improvement uh, which has been done here recently. And there's also the Queen's function Monte Carlo approach, there was a talk by Alessandro Lovato, so they have now very nice uh, wave function for the whole state, but nothing else above it. And uh, this is a picture from the no-core shell model, so uh, really up-to-date uh, chiral two and three body forces, and you see here, so these cluster states are really missing, or so maybe these are these here coming down very slowly. So the harmonic oscillator basis is really a bad choice if you want to describe this extended uh, cluster states. And what's maybe also interesting is even you look at this one plus state, uh, this doesn't seem to be so easy to describe that correctly. So this is very sensitive to spin orbit properties again. Um, so this has to be understood better in the future. So as I said, so to, to train myself, I started by doing a microscopic cluster model calculation, uh, which I can in a sense, is a subset of the FMD model. So I have an internal region, and here I just put three alphas on the grid, a triangular grid, and the hyper is just used, in a sense, to define uh, the set of basis states. And so you have here the wave function, so three alphas put at positions R1, R2, R3, and then you project everything on angular momentum at parity. And uh, for this uh, basis in a sense of Volkov, a simple Volkov interaction, simple central interaction has been tuned to give a very good uh, description of alpha alpha and also of a whole state position in carbon 12. So I use that. So that is 
in a sense, we're doing work in, in earlier models, uh, microscopic cluster model. And then in the external region, which I will then use to connect to continuum, I use the beryllium-8 plus alpha basis. And the beryllium-8, we will include not only the crown state, but also pseudo states so the two plus state, and then additional zero plus, two plus, and also four plus state. So this is obtained by diagonalizing alpha alphas up to distances of 10 fermi. So the beryllium-8 wave function is pretty extended. And uh, this is also, in a sense, very similar to calculations done by Pierre de Couffemont and uh, by Arai here, uh, so a very similar approach. Okay, just to get some idea of what can we expect, so I plotted here the beryllium-8 alpha energy surfaces, and then we take the beryllium-8 ground state, so we get here this blue curve. And uh, so here the dashed line uh, is uh, about 6 MeV above zero, but that is the localization energy in this GCM type wave function, where the kinetic energy is uh, due to the localization has a finite value. So more or less you can subtract that. So what you see here is essentially the Coulomb barrier of the beryllium-8 alpha system. And you see it's uh, located around 10 Fermi. So alone from that we can expect that the wave function will be very extended. And it's not very high. So the whole state is just above the threshold. So, so this will be has to tunnel through the barrier, which gives you a very small width of the whole state. But the 2 plus state is already, so we have to look here in the 2 plus system, is already above this barrier, so that uh, the width of the 2 plus state will be much larger than that of the whole state, naturally, what you would expect. You can also see here, so, um, so the red lines are when you build it up on the beryllium-8 2 plus, and these are all asymptotically much higher than the beryllium-8 0 plus. So the systems will prefer preferentially decay through the beryllium-8 crown state and not through the 2 plus state. And uh, so here, for the 2 plus, of course, it depends how you orient it, and so the most favorable situation is here the, you know, this kind of triangle configuration, and this even is lower than taking the beryllium-8 crown state. Okay, I have to speed up a little bit. So the first thing uh, I looked at was uh, how far can we go with a bound state approximation? So is, do we see convergence for observables, different con observables? And you see here for the whole state, for example, the energy, uh, it slightly changes, so we just include larger and larger beryllium-8 alpha distances. It uh, seems to converge more or less, and it's pretty close uh, to the energy that was more or less fixed. Um, but for the 2 plus energy already, it depends much more on the size of the model space. And if you look, for example, on this B2, the transition from the crown state to the second 2 plus state, yeah, here it's, you can't really say what, what should you take. So now we include the continuum. I won't go into the details, so to, to really do the matching, you have to transform the GCM into an RGM wave function. Um, but in the end, so you have a model space, so in the internal region, you really have this, all these free alpha configurations. Then you have an intermediate region where you only have beryllium A plus alpha, which you then match at your channel radius of 16 Fermi uh, to the asymptotic world of point-like beryllium A and alpha clusters. And uh, you can, for bound states, you match to the Wettiger functions. For resonances, you match to purely outgoing Coulomb, uh, uh, Coulomb wave functions, so this is a gamma wave function. And of course, you can also match the scattering states. So we have uh, different channels here. So incoming channel C0, and you can scatter to another channel uh, C. And so you have a scattering matrix as a function of energy. And to analyze the scattering, so we have, uh, we can look at the diagonal phase shifts, or we can look at the eigenphase shifts. And this is shown here for the zero plus. So you don't see the whole state, so the width is so small that uh, it's very hard to find it when scanning the energy, but it should, it's here. But when you see there's a uh, second resonance, in a sense, around 4 MeV, and this is both uh, when you look at the beryllium-8 crown state and the beryllium-8 2 plus. So this maybe is really a free-body resonance, so that you have a coupling going through both channels, beryllium-8 0 plus and 2 plus. But, uh, of course, free-body asymptotics microscopic is too hard for me, so I restrict <laughs> two-body asymptotics. Okay, two plus. Now we really have a nice resonance, so the S-matrix pole. Um, so for the cluster model, the width is only like 300 keV, but, uh, uh, so not 2 MeV, but that's probably a little bit too small. Uh, but you also see so I included here only the beryllium-8 crown state and the first 2-plus state. 
and then you go above 4 MeV in the situation when you take all the channels gets really messy. So I don't think it makes too much sense to speak of isolated resonances, but really there is some, some kind of broad continuum uh, of different configurations. So, but in the low energy region up to say 3 MeV above the threshold of 4 MeV, uh, we can really isolate this resonances, for example, also the 4 plus state. And uh, now we can use our gamma wave functions also to calculate observables. So, for example, for the radius of the Hoyle state, which is given here, so we end up with a value of like 4.0. Uh, 10, which is still significantly larger than obtained in the bound state approximation. And uh, so this is really a very large extended object, as I already indicated, when we look at the potential surfaces that we can expect that. And for this uh, E2 transition, we end up with a value of about uh, 2 compared, which is not too far ex from experiment. Okay, in the end, a short outlook on, so this is still work in progress. I'm, I'm more or less done, but I still want to check the numerics carefully so I don't really give numbers for, uh, for transition strengths and so on, but uh, it should be more or less reliable. And uh, the internal region here, uh, we again use our variation after projection. So we do a variation after projection with zero plus. Uh, as a function of a radius as a generator coordinate, when we keep that fixed and vary the energy of a second uh, zero plus, a third zero plus, do the same thing for two plus and so on. So it's really a set of about uh, 100 basis states obtained by variation after projection, different radii, different spins. Um, just to give you an idea, so what are the most important configurations? So this is done for the bound state approximation, so for the ground state, or for the first two plus state, you essentially have an intrinsic state which has a very large overlap, compact, D shell like state. The three minus already has some cluster structure, so it's not as compact as, as the uh, ground state, but it's certainly smaller than uh, the most important configurations for the Hoyle state or the second two plus state. And so, in, in our basis, there's not a single intrinsic state which gives you the full wave function, but it's really a superposition of different uh, triangular-like uh, alpha, alpha, alpha configurations. So, here I show the spectrum. So on the right we have experiment. So this is the 2 plus state with this very large width of 2 MeV. In the FMD I get something more or less like 1 MeV, which is maybe good. So as I said in the cluster model, it's too small, only 300 keV. We have this second 4 plus state. Um, we have a three minus state, so a negative parity band. So, so what you see in experiment that with, four, with two four plus states and a four minus state, almost at the same energy, I can also see here in our calculation. So this is related, or some people relate that to this. Uh, I think probably Martin will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, in internal structure, and uh, so now I also get in the FMD. Uh, spin flip states, so the 1 plus states and the t equal 1 states. In the cluster model, of course, they are not there. Um, and uh, there's also, when you calculate gamma of teller or M1 transitions in the cluster model, it's easy because everything is zero. So <laughs> if you want to compare to experiment, uh, we have to do something better. So here I show now the strength distribution, so that Hans already showed for the E2 on a linear scale here. So we really see this 2 plus peak, and when I, okay, it's not the same scale, but when I look here at the width of a peak with our state, which has one MeV, uh, it seems to agree more or less with the data. So uh, this extraction of a 2 MeV width from, from the data uh, is a little bit questionable from my point of view. I also have the E1 transition here, um, so at uh, the right position. And you can see here, so the blue line is always uh, the transition to the beryllium-8 ground state uh, continuum. The red line is the transition to the beryllium-8 2 plus. And there's also a gray line, so this is when transition to higher lying beryllium-8 pseudo states. So you see up starting at around 4 MeV, we also populate uh, the beryllium-8 2 plus. And uh, maybe this is, you know, when you look here in this region, uh, you have to when you do this R matrix fit on the data, uh, 
yeah, so it's not really the single resonance contribution here, but there are different things contributing to the total strength. And yeah, so this is the same plot at what Hans has shown. So this illustrates again, so when we look here at the E2 transition, so we have this strong peak for the second two plus state, but when we look at gamma of teller, so this, oops, this is only very weakly populated and it's the same thing with the M1. And the, the, the explanation is probably that this uh, second two plus state has a very large overlap with pure al beryllium 8 alpha configurations on the order of 98%. So there's a very small admixture of more P shell like configurations which you will populate by gamma of teller or by M1. In the whole state, it's only like 90% overlap with the clusters, pure cluster configuration. So you still have enough, in a sense, configurations to connect to with gamma of teller. Okay, so I'm out of time. I will just flash my summary and thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, uh, in the helium-3 alpha-gamma yeah. S-factor, the recent data of Erna showed an increase above 1 MeV, more or less. In the helium-3 alpha-gamma. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, so, you, yeah. so you mean this? Uh, yes, this so here. what is the theoretical interpretation for this increase? Where does it come from? Um, so when you decompose here the, the cross section, so there's a S wave uh, contribution, and if I compare, for example, with the Caccino calculation, um, so our our cross section falls off uh, a little bit more slowly, going to higher energy. So I have no real intuitive, intuitive explanation why it does that, but that seems to be the main difference. And then, of course, you have a linear contribution coming from, from the D-wave capture. So, um, so at 3 MeV, it's uh, essentially D-wave uh, capture. Um, but as I said, I, I don't really understand what is really that different between different calculations uh, in that respect. Because previous calculations were in agreement with previous data, which are different by a factor of two. So you mean here this? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So I, I didn't fit to the data. There's no no free parameter uh, in the calculation. So I I know that the Anna people for a long time kind of hesitated to to publish their results because it was in disagreement with. But there are now also some some new measurements from from Madrid and so on which confirm it. Other question there. Thomas, just to uh, clarify, so to reproduce this curve, uh, you had to shift the states to their experimental values, right? So you so don't get the states exactly. So which which ones are you talking? The states in 7. Uh, this reaction. Um, you, no, so it's, it's not really shifted. So in a sense, it depends a little bit on the interaction. So I have this unitary transformation, and you can shift that a little bit, not too much, maybe by about 100 keV if you choose this. Uh, so this is all, the interaction is done in two-body approximation, so you neglect three-body terms, and uh, so with that you can shift it a little bit. So, but uh, in a sense, I was lucky that I am. <laughs> so the absolute, I have to say, the absolute binding energies are not in very good agreement with uh, experiment, but this, the threshold seems to be much more stable with respect to, to the interaction. Yeah? So the energies with respect to the threshold. Uh, you, you showed at the very end some uh, shapes of the ground state which look like a pair or something like this. Oh, yeah, so here. What, what is this? So this is like a triangular, so this is the, the density of intrinsic state, state. Of course, yeah. So the, the
Yeah. Yeah, so it's, of course, yeah, you, 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 this one you do project on parity, so flip it, and also angular momentum projection. So in a sense, uh, that contributes here to the free minus, but uh, the, the dominant part intrinsic state of a free minus is more extended than this. So, but this mixes then with this one. So it's a, a linear combination of all the states. So this has some, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we have time to thank everybody for this uh, nice session. Yeah. Uh, I, don't see any announcement. I don't see any announcement, so I think you're uh, ready to go to eat and uh, to